Hallelujah. Here we go. Ready? Father, we thank you for your grace and your anointing and presence and revelation and building us up in this message in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, we're in this special period of time, which is in this two-week period from the biblical new year to Passover. A lot's happening. Everything's changing in the world, and we need a lot of spiritual discernment about what's going on right now. Really, all of us in the country felt spiritually all of a sudden like we're, hey, we're in a different period right now. Everything we've been praying this past six months for the war, sort of all of a sudden different. So that's really what I want to lead to. But before we get to that kind of discernment, I want to just give some biblical structure to the idea of time and what, because we're passing in this new year. So I'm not going to give the prophetic part. I want to just give the scriptural framework so then we can be ready to hear things from the Lord about what, what God has for these next two weeks are critical. This time from the biblical new year to Passover is a critical change of season. So I don't want to, I don't have discernment about that, right? I, I want to get discernment. So to do that, I want to make sure that I understand the biblical framework of what this change of season is. And then we get discernment. You know, I'm talking about a pattern anyway. You've got to understand the biblical pattern before you can get prophetic revelation. All right, let's go on. So I want to talk about the whole uh, concept of 12 months, a 12, uh, a 12 moon year, uh, the 12 months, the 12 moons. What does that mean that you have a new moon? That you have a new month? That you have a new year? That you have a new plan from God? All those things are in the Bible, and they're things that people are not used to studying. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about numbers and, and stars. That's not what I normally concentrate on. It's not, the, it's not the meat of the message. It's just a framework. So don't, don't take this overbalanced, but I want to set up a little framework on that. So let's go. We're going to just basically take one chapter from Genesis 1 and one passage from uh, Exodus 40. Genesis 1, verse 1, start at the beginning. This is the new year. So let's start at the, um, at the beginning here. Uh, Genesis 1. One through five. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the and the earth was a tovavo, just dark, confused, and and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the spirit of God hovered. The word using a bird language hovered like a bird over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light that was good. And God separated between the light and the darkness. And God called uh, the light day and uh, the darkness night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. Amen. That's the beginning of the Bible. Um, and th thinking about this, th th one thing to get discernment on is under this may sound shocking, but truth is binary. You know what I mean by bi binary? Two things. Everything in electronics, that I don't understand anything about it, but I understand this. You either have an a, 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 a electric charger, you don't. So it's one zero one zero one zero zero. Everything's built on that. Everything in your whole computer is only two two charges. It's either a charge or it's not a charge. It's so it's one 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 zero zero one 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 zero 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 one one one. It's just you either it. But the whole system is based on just a a binary thing. That's what digital is. It's binary. But all truth is binary by its nature. That's a little scary because God is the first cause. Once he causes something, you've already got a second thing. You've got a creator and a creation. So you've already got one, two. You've already got a paradox, a, a um, sort of a conflict already there. Because God, well, if you go back to it's just God alone, eternity before. Okay, that's one. But the, the minute he starts to do, the moment he does anything, then you have a, a built-in binary system where, you, where he creates something, and then you have to deal with those two things are different. So... Um, so, for instance, he says there that evening and morning is a day. See that? 
evening and morning is a day. Think about that. If you just had light, you'd never have a day because it would never end. It would just be, it, it, if you just had darkness, it would, you have darkness and light and then boop, it becomes a, one day, evening and morning, create the two together, create a third thing. And this goes, you just think about uh, the whole book of, of uh, the beginning of the book of Genesis. God creates a man and he creates a woman. And they're different. They're opposite. Despite what people say about non-being binary today, you can't be non-binary. It doesn't work. The, physically, not even saying something politically correct or incorrect, it doesn't work physically. Where there's, there's, there's a male and a female, and, and, and they're different. And so when you have light and day, you have darkness and light, and you had, but now, so when God creates something, he, he presents something, and then you have something opposite to it. To use philosophical terms instead of um, uh, physics terms, which is you have a thesis, and then you have an antithesis. You have an idea, and then you have an opposing idea, and so you figure out how to put those two ideas together, and they create a third idea, which is your synthesis. That's the way truth works. I mean, that's, that's, it, they happen to call that in philosophy, but that's the truth from the Bible. That you have, so, so you have a man and a woman, they become united, and they produce a third thing, which is a child. Well, that's the, and that, that's, how, that's what revelation is. This is a surprising. I've learned this from the Bible, that revelation, how do you get revelation to something? Why do you need revelation? Why can't you just see the obvious facts? Revelation means you take two things that are different. You don't see how they work together. The revelation is you figure out, God shows you how to put the two together, and then they make a third thing. That's the revelation. If you don't have a revelation, you just see two things that are opposing. That's why politicians, you know, basically they're all on one side. They're just arguing one thing. They can't see the other side. To see what, and, and so to understand something, you have to see both sides, figure out how they contrast one another, figure out how to resolve them, and that's what gives you the truth. And so what happens is, and this is hard for people in general, and it's also hard for believers. I don't know if I would say it's particularly hard for us as spirit filled believers, but look. Truth is complex. Truth is always binary. It's always paradoxical. You have two sides to it, and you have to hold on to both of them to get to the to get to the truth that God wants. I'll give you an example. Jesus Yeshua he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now those two pictures are totally opposite. A roaring lion and a and a slaughtered lamb are as far as apart as you can get. And if you just see those two things, it doesn't make any sense. In Judaism, because they don't see Yeshua, they say, wait a minute, do we have a, there's one Messiah who's the son of Joseph and one who's the son of David. Is it two? Do we get one if we're good, one if we're bad? We have, they can't figure it out. Once you see Yeshua, pop, it's the same thing. Well, you, you, the revelation is that you combine, you figure out two things that don't seem to fit together, how they fit together, and then it creates a, a third. That's the revelation. Now, what that means is when we're, walking in something i don't want to be too philosophical i'm talking about an experience of us as believers you're trying to grapple with the things of god and it always seems to be pulling you in two directions i think you prayed today from ezekiel holding the two sticks that's classic that's biblical truth he's got judah on one hand israel on the other hand and he's trying to hold them together and it's tearing them apart because they're having a civil war well that's what we we are like as believers are we for israel for the church well for us Israel and the church become one. You know, it's, it's, that's the revelation that we have. We hold those things. And every truth that we're, as, as believers, are we supposed to be bold or are we supposed to be humble? Uh, yes. You know, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So you always said, so you feel it's tiring. I feel like all the time, everything we're praying for, it's like you're holding, trying to hold on to two opposites. You think, Could, couldn't I just have something that's simple? Doesn't work that way. You know, it's, uh, because. It's just not the way things work. And so as believers, you are always trying to hold on to two things. And what I want to say is don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of the fact that you're dealing with two things that seem opposite. Because we always want to have just a simple, the simple answer is always in Yeshua. Now, ultimately, right, he's the answer. But how those two things fit together in Yeshua, that's where you have to hold them together. And it's not easy, you know. Uh, you know, are, are we supposed to rebuke or are we supposed to forgive? You know, I mean, we're, it's, it's, there's, uh, there's always this double dynamic. And now it, it comes in, I think, from the moment that God said, let there be light. We've had several discussions on our team 
particularly with Orna, who I wanted to see this, but he said, well, you know, so, but God, did God create good and evil? Uh, it, well, yes and no. The answer is this. God creates good. But when you create good, you're obviously creating the possibility of not good. You see what I'm saying? You can't create good without creating the possibility that there's not good. So if you create good, you're also creating evil. You can't create good without creating the possibility that there's not good. You can't create light without being a possibility of darkness. You all, whenever you do something, and that's what the third law of thermodynamics is, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, that means another thing is whatever we do that's good, you're displacing darkness, which means you're going to have a chemically, mathematically, physically, thermodynamic rule that you're going to get the exact same opposite uh, 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 opposition to you, to resistance to you. That's the way it works. The, the more you push forth the light, the, the more you're pushing back on darkness. It, it's, it just it goes the same. So we have to deal with these two different things uh, coming together that what we do creates an option. God is love. To have love, you've got to create another person. You can't love if you're just alone. The minute God creates another person, he's the creator, you've got a creation. That's a, that's a paradox. So the moment you have God as a creator and he creates something because he loves, you have a, have a difference. So if you have love, you have to have free choice. Well, if you have the ability for somebody to choose to love, he can obviously choose not to love. So if the moment you create something good, you've created the, the non-good as an option, you can't not do it. Either you didn't create it. So did God create good and evil? Yes, in the sense that he created only good. But when you create good, you make the possibility that there's evil coming there. So he takes responsibility. Yeah, I did that. I'm responsible for it. I take responsibility for there's good and evil. Now you figure it out. You choose. You deal with the good and evil and make sure you figure out how to choose the, the right thing. So God's not, that's his responsibility. We're taking, taking his responsibility for creation. It's an, it's an amazing thing. Um, all right. Notice there also, just as it said, the word one. That's the first time the word one is used in the Bible. Long before in Deuteronomy, it says God is one. You know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Echad. That's, that's Deuteronomy 6, but this is Genesis 1. The first thing, morning and evening, I mean, evening and morning, day one. So you have the one there, is, it's, that's the one truth, but by pulling two things together and making them one. All right. You with me so far? I'm, uh, listen, I'm, I'm trying to set something up here because when we're dealing with what's going on in Israel right now, we're dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of conflicting ideas that they could make you go crazy. You know, on, on all the different sides of this is a very complicated issue. And to even begin to discern it, you're, you're torn in the midst of uh, honored directions. I want to say, don't worry about it. That's the nature of standing for truth is you're dealing with these conflicting forces and ideas around you. Well, that's where we stand in that. Let's not be afraid. If you don't, if we try to cop out of that, you're, you're going to come up with the wrong answer. Because you're getting the right answer doesn't come out of just moving back into an easy situation. It doesn't work that way. You're dealing with, there's conflict in the situation. All right, let's go on. I only got three verses here. Here's the second one. Genesis 1, verse 14 to 16. Let's jump down a little bit. And here we're going to talk about time. All right. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven and to distinguish between the day and the night and let them be for signs and for appointed times and for days and for years. It's amazing that God built into this whole situation, built in the creation of the heavens. He said four different things there signs and appointed feasts and days and years that God built in a time system that's connected with the heavenlies. Amazing. We'll talk about more of that in just a moment. Uh, verse 15. Um, and the lights in the heavens were to, uh, to uh, bring light upon the earth, and it was so. 
המאור הגדול לממשלת היום והמאור הקטן לממשלת הלילה ואת הכוכבים. קטון. He says here, and, and God made uh, the two uh, great lights, the greater light to, to have governance or dominion over the day, and the smaller light to have dominion over the night together uh, and with the stars. Now, God introduces here the idea of time. Now, in Greek and in Hebrew, you have two different types of time, and they're similar as far as I can tell. In, in Greek, you have chronos and kairos, and in Hebrew, you have zman and et. Very similar concept. Chronos and zman is the system of standardized time, which comes in a sequence that's just there. And then you have, uh, then you have et o kairos, which is your experience of something when it's happening during a time, something coming to pass in a time. Now, you could say, you could almost compare it to Scripture. Kronos and Zman is like the Scriptures. It's a set thing. And then the Kairos and the, and the Itui is the prophetic implication of it. It's something that happens now. You experience it. You don't experience Kronos or Zman. That's just the system. You experience uh, uh, something happening in that time frame. That's Itui in Hebrew or Kairos in, in Greek. So he's setting up He's describing to us here what the chronos or zman system is. He wants us, he's describing to us what the framework is so that then we can get discernment. So I'm leading this up so we can, I can, so we can understand what this framework of time that we're in today and tomorrow and these two weeks so that then we can get discernment. I'm not even trying to get any discernment. I don't know what this is. I want to make sure that we understand together what this framework is so that we can ask what the discernment of times is. You don't need a discernment of the chronos. You can look on, a, you know, look on a calendar. You need a discernment of the kairos, just like it's in Hebrew. You don't need really discernment of the zman. You, uh, you, you need a discernment of the itui. Uh, ma, ma Yeshua said, you don't know, the, the, it, it, you don't know the, the it. You don't know the timing. That's a discernment. doesn't mean you don't have a calendar. All right. Let's look at this a little bit. So we describe the difference between chronos and kairos. There's another thing that happens here which I won't go into, it's a different teaching, I just want to touch on it. But the mathematical system of creation is built on seven. Six plus one is seven. If you have a cycle of seven, what's eight? Eight is one. Eight repeats the cycle. So in the Bible, it's a different lesson we won't go into today, but I just want to tell you there's a whole bunch of things that will come, happen on the eighth day, which is the first day. Like Christians celebrate their Sabbath on, or whatever, the resurrection of Yeshua on the eighth day, which was the first day. You understand, wait a minute, Yeshua had to be raised on the eighth day, the eighth thousandth year, the eighth day of circumcision, the eighth day of tabernacles, the eighth day of the, the dedication of the priests, and so on, the eight, because when you're in a seven-number cycle, the eight repeats, goes back to one, and restarts the system. Well, obviously, that's the day that the Holy Spirit would be poured out, that's the day that Yeshua would be raised from the dead, that's the day we'll have the new creation at the end of the Bible. That's it. it all works. Out. All I'm saying is that God has got, when he built this whole system, he built a system of timing into it that all fits together. It's amazing. Really fun. All right. Uh, number three. Uh, the sun says, so he describes here two systems of timing, two systems of chronos, zman. Okay, we're not getting to discernment here. We're just talking about the format. And one is based on the sun, and one is based on the moon. Let's just go over that real quickly. I'm just saying something here that would be sixth grade understanding of the sun cycle, the solar cycle, and the moon cycle, okay? The earth goes around the, the, the sun in about 365 days. But it's actually 365 and a quarter days. So that's why once every four years, if you're on a solar calendar, you have to add one day. To, 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 met, to, to straighten it back up. If not, after a thousand years, you would be, you know, a thousand, you'd be totally, the summer would be winter. So you add that in, that's the solar system, all right? And then the moon goes around the earth while it's going around this 12 times a year. But it's about three days off on that when it goes around it. So you have to add, if you're going on a lunar calendar, like it is in Judaism, then once every several years, 
you have to add another month to catch up all what, what those days that you missed to match the lunar month, to match the, the, solar year, the solar calendar. Okay? So you're going around, you have to add that on. So in Judaism, what do we do? We have a, a Shnat Mubar, which is a Mubarich, is that's when we add another month in to make the, solar, the lunar calendar match up with the solar calendar. We just had that this year. We had two months of Adar this year. That's the, that's the way. In Islam, as far as I know, and I don't know that much about Islam, it's just lunar. There is no, there is no readjustment to the solar calendar at all, which means each year the months change a little bit. That's why Ramadan is always at a different season because it just keeps moving. You never match up. So you have solar system, the lunar system, and then you have reconciling the solar system and the, and the lunar system. Isn't that amazing? That's all built in the Bible. Now, what God said here is those are, we got ready for that now. He says these are a governmental system. Oh, whoa, whoa. a governmental system? What are you talking about? That's in Genesis 1. I didn't make this up. Three times he says, Lim Shol, Mem Shelet, Mem Shelet. He talks about that the sun and the moons and the stars is giving us a framework for understanding God's government upon the earth. Let's start with that. There's two types of government. There's bright government and dark government, or lesser, or brighter government and less brighter government. There's a sun government and a moon government. And all that's, and that's, that's going to think how much this has to do with Christianity, with Judaism, with Islam. It's, it's amazing how all these things fit together. Now, so you have a government system in that, and, uh, and that's what rules. But he says it's also, now we're getting closer, but he says it's also, for times, signs, and appointed feasts. He said he built that all into it. Uh, one more thing about government before we get there. So the ultimate government is, of course, the sun, which is Yeshua. He's the ultimate governor over everything. His face shines like the sun. He is the ultimate leader of all things. We will all shine like stars in the kingdom to come. We're lesser levels of that. All these things are, are, are fitting together. That's why now, he said that now let's go to the, the lunar. The lunar has 12. So 12 loop, 12 months in a year, 12 moons. Month and moon is the same word. Moon, month. There's 12 months, moons in a year. So it comes in. And so Jacob had 12 sons. And Jesus had 12 disciples. Solomon had 12 rulers from each of the tribes ruling over each, each of them taking a month of his provision. The, month, the number 12, and Yeshua said it was 12 disciples who then became apostles. He said, you go from being apostles, to, from being disciples to being apostles, and then when I come back, you're going to be kings ruling over on 12 thrones, ruling Israel, and therefore ruling the nations. So 12 is a government system based on the loops in the moon. You see, the idea that Jesus had 12, Yeshua had 12 disciples, and Jacob had 12 sons, and there's 12 tribes of Israel. That's not a coincidence. That's built into the creation when God made 12 moons because he's got a, a, a secular government that the people are going to be taking turns in how we're ruling together. What an amazing thing. All right, let's come up to this, to what happens now in this month. Uh, so you have 12 moons that are going around. The moon, uh, you know, turns each night we really ought to uh be more aware of the moon don't forget the bible was written in a desert climate and the people in the desert knew exactly what what phase of the moon it was they didn't need a paper calendar because they could see from the moon exactly what day of the month it was not just what month it was they could see what day it is this is this, again this is sixth grade you know solar system stuff but it's, i'll just describe it to you you have a full moon on the, on the most calendar, on the Jewish calendar, well, also on the Islamic calendar, the full moon comes on the 14th or 15th day of the month. It has to be exactly in the middle. Okay? The full moon, the moon doesn't have any light, right? The moon is reflecting the sun's light. So the full moon has to come when the moon is exactly opposite the sun. Every month of every year, in it, for thousands of years, the, the full moon goes up as the sun is setting. That's why when you have a full moon, 
It'll come up right at sundown. It starts to rise. God did that on purpose. I'll tell you why in just a moment. Now, if, when you have a half moon, that's exactly on the seventh day and the 21st day of the month, depending if it's on this side or this side. And you could see it, and you can watch the moon going from, from a half moon to a quarter moon. You can, you, can, you can figure out which day of the month it is just by looking at it. And we ought to be, don't forget, our forefathers lived in the desert. They saw this every day. They could see what day it is. Now, the opposite of the full moon, concentrate you for another minute, is the new moon. The new moon is when you don't see it at all. When you get a little sliver, you're just either one day before the new moon or one day after the new moon. And that always rises with the sun. So the, a full moon rises opposite the sun. A half moon rises at halfway through the night. And a new moon rises together with the sun. That's why you almost don't see it. You have to just catch the new moon, the little sliver, right before, be right before the sun comes up or right before the sun goes down. And then on the day of the new moon itself, a new moon is a zero moon. The 15th is a full moon. A new moon is a zero moon. That's when you don't see anything. That's what it is. That's why everybody prays because you don't see the moon. Why? Because it's exactly where the sun is. It's there. It hasn't changed. The, the moon hasn't changed at all. It's just where it is represented with the sun. Are you with me so far? No, so it just comes up at that, and so it comes that way. So you don't see it. It's a little sliver. And then you wait until you say, oh, we see a sliver. It's a new, the, new, the new month is starting. That's the first day of the month. Which also means, watch this, every single lunar, every single solar eclipse that has ever happened has happened on the 14th, 15th day of the, of the month. I'm sorry, on the first day of the month. Sorry, sorry. With, on the new moon, it has to because that's when the moon is close to the sun. What is eclipse? It's just when the moon passes in front of the sun. That has to be on the new moon day. You got that? That has to be on the zero day. If it was even a sliver, it wouldn't be an eclipse. So that means that, I mean, if there was a big eclipse that went across the United States. And why? That was on the new moon day. It had to be on the new moon day. Or the moon wouldn't have been there to have to have make an eclipse. So the new moon is on, an eclipse is always on that. It's on that day. Now, all right. So that's, uh, let's look at now as, as we come in. So. In this 12-month system, we're on the last one now, let's, let's jump up to, uh, to, to uh, Exodus 40. In Exodus 12, it says clearly, the first month of the biblical year is Nisan. And it's also in the, the original Hebrew name, Nisan is actually a later name, the original Hebrew name was Aviv, which is the same name as spring. The first month of the biblical calendar is the first month of spring. Doesn't that make sense? Sure it does. Amazing that just Christian tradition went this way, Jewish tradition went this way, this, 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 this Islam tradition went another way. It's, it, it's all okay. Everybody has their different cultures. That's fine to do that. But we are Bible believers. We accept all the other ones, you know. But at least got to be more important to us, the Bible. The Bible says this day, this past week, this has been the new moon. And on this one day, the first month of spring, which is Nisan or Aviv, that new moon is the new year. Is that clear? Is that obvious? I'll just say it again. I don't want to get complicated. The new moon on the first month of the year is the new year day. That's the new moon. That's what you know, it was this week. So we have it. We just come across the new moon. We're stepping into a new year. This is amazing. Now, on the full moons, the full moons are always in the middle of the month. Okay, on the 14th, 15th day. Amazingly enough, God, God designed that. He said in Genesis 1, before he gave us the holidays, the sun and the moon will be for Moadim, for appointed times. And the Passover is on a full moon. Every Passover, when every family is going out to eat, you'll see it's, you're going, sitting down to have your meal at a big full moon that you got the whole night, light, lights up the sky. And... The same thing is true in tabernacles. And you're supposed to go out and live in a tent right during the big full moon. And, right, Passover, right, coming out of Egypt. And Purim. Purim is also on a full moon. 
So when you celebrate, uh, when you're having a feast for Purim, that's also on a full moon. Two other times we get a full moon. Anybody know what they are? I'll give you a hint. The word, the name for 15 in Hebrew is in letters, Tet Vav, which comes out to the word Tu. Tu. Tu Bishvat, which is the full moon of the month of, usually around February, which is the, for the trees. Sorry, that's when the, the Shkidiot, the um, almond trees start to blossom. And then you have Tu Ba'av, which is kind of a, another cult, Jewish cultural thing, which is the Jewish Valentine's Day is in the summer, 15th day of the, of the month of Av, of August. It's it. So they have five holidays. Tu Bishvat, Tu Ba'av, Pesach, Purim, and Sukkot are all on a full moon. Amazing. But the new moon is at the beginning of the month. And the, and the new moon of the first month is the first day of the year. That's where we're at right now. Okay, let's try Now, what happened? Let's try to finish this up. What happened on that day? What happened on that day? Very simple, very clear scriptures. Exodus chapter 40. Now, uh, what happened here is that we left Egypt at Passover, 15th of the first month. The whole book of Exodus takes a whole year. You come to the last chapter of the book of Exodus, you're exactly a year after. So this is the first month at the end of the whole first year, the first month of the second year. What happened? Verse 2. Exodus 40, verse 2. Bayom ha-chodesh ha-rishon be-achad la-chodesh. On the first month, on the first day of the month, takim et mishkan ohel moed. You will set up the, the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. That's the meaning of the New Year's. And then he goes on in verse 34. What happened on that day? What happened when they set up the tabernacle? Verse 34, this is amazing. Vayichas anan et ohel moed uchvod Adonai male et amishkan. Wow. On this day, on the biblical New Year's Day, two things happened. They set up the tabernacle and the spirit and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. That is the meaning of New Year's. That's how God celebrated. Now, one last thought is that in God's planning, just like any architect or any engineer, the thing that you get to at the end is the first thing you plan, right? I mean, you don't, you don't, you plan the end of the building. You don't plan when you, you don't plan that you're going to dig the first hole. You plan on the architectural plan what the la the very last nail that you're going to put in, and when you're going to turn the lights on in the building. That's what this is. This is an architectural plan. The first day of the first month of the year is showing what, we're, what God is he's telling them. This is what I'm trying to build here. I'm building a tabernacle, and I want to fill the tabernacle with the Holy Spirit. How? Now, what I said, the truth is always binary. It's got a mashal and a nimshal in, in terms of Hebrew, which is a parable, and it's, it's um, in interpretation. It's too many. And, but the tabernacle, that's a parable. God's not looking to build a tabernacle. He's building to, looking to build what? Us. He's looking to build people into a dwelling place for himself and fill us up with his spirit. Now, does that make sense? But God's first architectural plan at the first day of the new year is telling where he wants to be at the end, where we all, the people that believe in him and submit to him, he allow, we allow him to form us together into one tabernacle is crafted together beautifully made with all its different parts. And then he fills us up with himself and with his spirit, and with his glory, he says, that's my plan. How obvious do I have to make it for you? Amazing. So we feel all these tensions, you know what I'm saying? Building the temple, the red heifer, yes, no. We're going to attack this, we're going to attack that. Let's understand what the system is before we go to, um, before we try to figure out what the immediate discernment is. So all this is just setting up a stage and I've given zero discernment about the Kairos right now. All I want to say, though, is that we've passed in to a different time. This is a big deal. This is not, and we can feel it in this country. Those of us who are praying, something's different right now than it was a couple days ago. I mean, it's, it, we're, in a, we're in a new season, a, a new moon, a new stage of the planet. Something's happening here, and we need to stop and say, whoa, this is, we're in that crucial period between the new moon between the new year and Passover. Remember that the new year is always, in that sense, two weeks after Purim, 
two weeks before Passover. Has to be. Full moon, full moon, new moon. Full moon, full moon, new moon. Full moon at Purim, two weeks. New Year's, two weeks. Passover. That's where we're at. We're moving right in this stage. We're coming in to Passover with, the, with this whole time of the whole story of Passover and the ex exodus from Egypt and everything that's going. Wow. And we're living in a moment on these New Year's Day when the diplomats of all the United Nations are voting to destroy Israel. Let's not worry about it. We have no worry. God's got a plan that's been from the beginning of time. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. If you create, well, oh, now I hear the Holy Spirit saying something. When God created Israel, equal and opposite reaction, it created hatred uh, among the other nations for Israel. You can't create a chosen, for, you can't have a first nation without the other nations getting angry at it. That's just the way it goes. So God has his ways. What he, he keeps rotating it so other people get different jobs to do different things. That you've got to trust the Lord. But, but anytime you create something, you can, it creates an opposite reaction to it. And God is doing something wonderful. Maybe this is one last discernment and then I'll stop. Was that everybody looks at all the war and all the horrible propaganda that's coming out. Folks, all that is the equal opposite reaction of it all. Whatever you see going on, looks pretty bad and looks pretty scary. No, 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 no. God is doing something good. God is doing something powerful. He is establishing his kingdom on the earth. On the earth. He's calling, he's making, think about this at no time in history this ever. Every single nation in the world is thinking about Israel. Every single nation in the world is thinking about what does Zion mean. Every single nation in the world is thinking about this conflict is about Jerusalem. Every single nation in the world is thinking about the Temple Mount, for goodness sake. That's the name of this war. This is, this is all what you see that looks so scary. That's just the darkness. That's just the tohu and the vohu. That's respond. This is God is creating light. He's creating his kingdom in this world, and you're sensing that. So the first thing I want to say for discernment for all of you, I see all of my dear friends, my dear believing friends, and I, I see the, the weight of the darkness moving. I see them starting to get tired and losing hope and, and, and losing, starting to doubt and what's going on and getting, no, no way. God's in control. He's doing something good. All that you see that's bad out there is just a, the negative reflection to the light. It's in us. Let's be bold. Let's be strong. Let's be hopeful. Let's know that God's got a plan. He's in control. He's in control of every single thing, even right now, that when they voted on that, there was an eclipse in the United States and it was a new moon in Israel. And come on, God's in control here. From the eclipse to the United Nations to the Jerusalem to the Jewish calendar to the, to the solar calendar, the lunar calendar, he's, God's in control here. Come on, we walk with him. And, I, and, and one last thing also I want to say is that I've been going over and over and over the passages of war in the Bible. I want to give you this. So that'll be another teaching another time. I'm just thinking of writing a book on it, that's uh, Theology of War. But, but God is never at a loss for power in a war. Never. He can win a whole war with one person. He's never outnumbered. That's just the opposite. Too many people get in the way. You know? He's never outnumbered. His only question is, make sure you're being righteous. If you are righteous and submitted to me, I will fight for you. Never worry about the, the upscale of power. It's never an issue of power because he says, I've got all power. I'm a man of war. I'm the God of the, of the armies of Israel. I'm the prince of the armies of heaven. I, I can handle this war. That's no problem. You guys can go to sleep. You can wake up in the morning and every, you'll get up and everybody will be dead of your enemies. That's not the point. The point is to make sure that we are righteous. Are we righteous? No, that's what we better be praying about. You know, that's what we better be praying about for this nation. You know, it's not a power struggle. God's got all power, but he's holy. And he's calling and war is calling us to check our hearts, to repent, to get aligned with him. That's it. Hallelujah. Just take a moment to pray just to seal that. And I'll turn it over to Ariel. Father, we thank you right now that we can just learn, Lord, that we're stepping into our Kairos Itui in our little experience of this time that you had plan from beginning to end. It's got the stars and the suns and the moons and the, and the nations in Israel and, and history from beginning to end. We're just walking in our part of it right now. So we take solace and comfort and encouragement and strength and hope and victory. Lord, we're just submitted to you. 
We're trusting to you. And all we need for war is not power. All we need is moral clarity. Moral clarity wins war, not armaments. Lord, we don't need weapons. We need moral clarity. Thank you, Lord, for us being submitted to you and your righteousness. And you have all the power. We just need to make sure we're on your side and we're correctly lined up with you. Thank you, Father. And let us know, Lord, I pray for the body here in Israel and around the world, and even for the nations, actually, to understand what time are we in? What time is it? What's happening? What's happening in the history of the nations? What, what new year? What are we stepping into right now between the new year and Passover? What's happening here, God? Thank you, Lord. Forgive us now that we know your, your Kronos, Zman system. Lord, fill it up now with your Kairos prophetic itui timing discernment that we can know how to walk in that as we walk in this new year. I pray for that for everybody right now to spread out from us and all around. Lord, that you would give us now discernment of the times and the timing that we're walking in. What part of this stage of your plan are we in? In Yeshua's name, amen. Yeah, toda. Wow. I was just thinking the, the verse there in Exodus 40, 34. It says that the cloud covered the tent of meeting, right? And a cloud, you think, what is a cloud? A cloud is what blocks you from seeing the sun or the moon or the light. And then the glory of God is revealed in the, in the tabernacle. And that's the picture. It's all, like you said, it's all a, a mashal or a metaphor for, you know, you read the end of the book of Revelation. He's coming. His tabernacle will be here. We won't need the sun or the moon or the star, because he will be, his glory is that light, is that energy, it's life. And that, uh, but right now we can't, if you, if you don't have that cloud, it'll, it'll kill you. But uh, when we're in our resurrection body, it's just, we'll be like the stars reflecting it. So, so it's all part of his big plan. And um, yeah, the other thing I thought about is that you know, the ancients, from what we can tell, they didn't, what you described as basic sixth grade understanding of the solar system is not what they thought. They thought until, I think until Galileo, is that right? Or Copernicus? That, that basically we were the center of the universe and the sun and the moon were both revolving around us, right? Uh, there's still maybe some who would try to preach that today. Um, but to think that, what, what, what we know is, I mean, believe is true, uh, and that's why all of the astronomy and, you know, the, what do you call them, spaceships, everything works, is that there's a, the sun, we, he is the center, and we revolve around, everything revolves around him, around the sun. But then he's created us in his image and those angels, like we, studied, we started with Psalm 103, there's a whole revelation about the universe that revolves around us as the children of God. And that's like the moon, you know, which does revolve, or we are the center of the moon's orbit. So it's both those things. God bless you. See you all, and see you all who are out there and will be watching this in a few days. Rosh Chodesh Tov, we, uh, we say Chodesh Tov, or happy month. We're Recording this just at the beginning. Today's the first day of Nisan, right? It was started last night. Um, and uh, 14 days later, will be Passover. We're expecting that and expecting God to do great things during this time. God bless you.